इन फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ so good evening everybody and welcome to this bus rising star terrific trauma session part 2 and to introduce the concept and to welcome our judges and invite uh, dr sanjay the president of bombay orthopedic society over to you sir thank you ashok good evening everyone welcome back to this uh, i think this is the fifth episode i think ashok yeah it's fifth right? fifth episode of this series we are doing pre viral for the moment uh, i'm sure you know the concept now by now it is uh, you have already been shared the guidelines and all that uh, i it's my pleasure to introduce our judges today we, we don't need any introduction dr vikas agash uh, who has taught us also uh, he is one of the well known trauma surgeons and infection specialists so he will be judging you today and um, besides we have dr harshad argekar who was on there earlier also thank you he is also a trauma surgeon professor in cooper hospital and dr ashish fadnis who is again a well known surgeon from jupiter hospital thani these three will be judging you today and i'm sure uh, you know the basic guidelines you have to stick to timing you have to present during that and then be followed by question answer session so back to ashok i think yeah over so, to neeraj dr neeraj bijlani secretary of bos for introducing the candidates today yeah hi good evening everyone uh, so welcome to the terrific trauma session number 2 and this is uh, with three, there are going to be three presenters today so hopefully one of them can become the rising star of the future so one the first presenter is going to be dr rudra prabhu he is going to talk on surgical approaches for radial head fractures current techniques and outcomes the second speaker is going to be dr sharukh khan he is going to talk on humerus shaft fractures plate fixation versus intramedullary nailing and the third speaker is going to be dr vasav somani he is going to be speaking on management of montagia fractures surgical techniques and outcomes with this i uh, in, uh, start the i would hand over back to ashok to start the program so thank you dr sir and neeraj and we'll start the program now uh, i'll invite uh, Dr. Rudra Prabhu to start sharing his presentation. Meanwhile, each candidate has eight minutes to present, followed by question and answer from the judges. So, Rudra, you can start. I'll be timing the presentations. Yes, sir. Is my screen visible? Yes. And you're on. You can go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Rudra Prabhu. I am an assistant professor currently working at uh, KM Hospital. I would like to thank the Bombay Orthopedic Society for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my topic for today is uh, surgical approaches and current techniques for managing radial head fractures. So, why is the radial head important? The radial head is an important stabilizer of the elbow against valgus instability, especially when the MCL is incomplete. It is responsible for 60% of the total load transmission across the elbow. and it is a marker for associated injuries of the inward extremity uh, the objectives of my presentation would be to review the current surgical approaches and current techniques for managing these fractures i have included pubmed index original articles review articles as well as meta analysis in this presentation uh, starting with the basics the mason hodgkin classification is one of the oldest classification of radial head fractures however it has stood the test of time it includes four types non displaced displaced comminuted as though and the fourth one is when there is an associated elbow dislocation the ao classification divides the radial head fractures into extra articular partial articular and complete articular fractures uh the associated injuries uh, with the radial head fractures in a study by vanjie et al the incidence of associated injuries in a retrospective analysis of 333 cases was 39% the associated injuries could be mcl or ncl injuries or the more dangerous terrible side of the elbow or the less common sx loprestty injury or isolated coronary fractures coming to the surgical approaches there are mainly four well known surgical approaches for radial head fractures the kaplan the cocker the limited cocker and the ebc split which is the extensor digitorum communis split approach the kaplan uh, approach uses the interval between the extensor digitorum communis and the ecrb when the cocker approach uses the interval between the inconius and the extensor cocca and maris 
The advantages of the Kaplan approach is that there is less risk of injury to the LCL, while with the Cocker approach, there is less risk of injury to the posterior entrosis nerve. However, the Kaplan approach is proximal to the posterior entrosis nerve, whereas the risk of injury to the LCL with the Cocker approach is more. Uh, this is a study which was published in 2019, which compared the Kaplan approach and the Cocker approach in the treatment of radial head fractures. Uh, it used the 3D digitizer to measure the visible surface area. And as per this approach, the surface area of the radius visible by the Kaplan approach was the maximum. The Kaplan approach also offered the exposure of the coronoid when it was extended proximally. This is a diagram which compares the area which was visible by each of the three approaches. And uh, uh, it is uh, visible in the Kaplan approach provided the uh, maximum visualization. The authors concluded that the Kaplan approach is the most extensive. It preserves the LCL as well as helps in visualization of the coronoid. This was a study published in 2014 in JBGS, which compared the extensor digitorum communis in the Cocker interval. Uh, the authors concluded that the EDC split approach provided more visualization of the anterior half of the radial head. And it was also associated with lesser risk of injury to the lateral uh, ulnar collateral ligament complex. Uh, another approach uh, which is less commonly used is the posterior approach, uh, which utilizes the void interval between the enconius and the ECU. The advantage of this approach is that the radial head or lignon, as well as the coronary fracture can be addressed, and there is lesser risk of injury to the posterior and process nerve. This is an article which is published in 2023, which uh, states that the posterior approach is a good approach for managing radial head fractures when there are associated fractures such as the olipron and the coronary. Coming to the management, the management of non displaced fractures is hematoma immobilization as followed by immobilization in non sleep for two days. The important thing to note here is that early mobilization is very essential because shorter period of mobilization are associated with better patient reported outcome measure scores. This is evident by the uh, two articles mentioned in this slide. The management of Mason type 2, a stable partial articular displaced fractures, is a bit controversial. This is an article published in 2014 by Yu Natal, where he compared 30 cases uh, managed conservatively, while 30 cases were managed with open reduction internal fixation. All the patients included had isolated partial articular radial head fractures, which were displaced more than 2 mm but less than 5 mm. The authors concluded that there was no clinical benefit with ORIF at a short term follow. Another study published in 2020 in the Journal of Shoulder and Elbow Surgery uh, concluded that open reduction internal fixation as well as conservative treatment both offer satisfactory functional outcomes when uh, used for the management of uh, mesen type 2 radial head fractures. Age and activity level is important to be considered before treatment, and the incidence of osteoarthritis was higher in the conservatively managed group. This was a, a meta analysis published in 2019. Uh, regarding comminuted uh, fractures of the radial head. The authors concluded that the radial head arthroplasty was the most effective treatment, while the radial head resection was the safest choice for minimizing post-operative complications. Twelve comparative studies, as well as one randomized control trial, were included in this meta-analysis. Uh, this article published in 2015 regarding radial head resection concluded that uh, radial head excision was a good option in elderly patients. Uh, the patients included uh, were 30 patients and they were more than 65 years old and all had comminuted radial head fractures. To summarize, all type 1 fractures can be managed conservatively. Type 2 fractures with no block to rotation, it is debatable conservative versus ORIF. If there's a block with rotation, uh, ORIF is preferred in type 2 fractures. In type 3 fractures with 2 to 3 simple fragments, ORIF can be done. However, if there are more than 3 unstable fragments, radial arthroplasty is the preferred treatment. Coming to osteosynthesis, screws or plates. The problems with the radial head plate include risk of violating the safe zone, increased risk of injury to PIN, as well as the need for implant removal. What is the solution? Low profile screw fixation. This technique uses screws to fix the head to the neck. The advantages include lesser implant irritation and lesser need for implant removal. This uh, biomechanical study published in 2019 compared three techniques for fixing radial neck fractures. The authors concluded that the cross screw construct was optimal for mason type 2 fractures, whereas the plate was associated with the least stiffness. Arthroscopy offers excellent visualization but requires expertise. Uh, this is a study published in 2023 which compared uh, arthroscopic reduction versus open reduction. Uh, it included 32 patients with a mean follow up of 10 years. 
the authors concluded that uh, arthroscopy was associated with a lesser incidence of postoperative stiffness. It is a safe and reproducible procedure, but requires a longer learning curve. In cases of radial head fractures, which are comminuted and not fixable and associated with postural instability, valgus instability to MCL injury or axial instability due to introscious membrane injury, radial arthroplasty should be preferred as this treatment offers stability as well. To conclude, uh, each uh, surgical approach should be individualized as per the fracture configuration and the associated injuries. Maintain elbow function by restoring ulnar humeral joint. It is important to re-establish elbow stabili uh, stability and the management should be decided by assessing all aspects, stability, combination, articular depression, as well as the associated injuries. Uh, these are my references uh, for the presentation. Uh, thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, Dr. Rudra. You finished with four seconds left. That means optimally utilizing the time given. <laughs> So I'd like to invite the judges now for their questions. Uh, Agashya, sir, you can go ahead with your questions. Yeah. Hello, Rudra. First of all, uh, good evening, sir. Good evening. Very nice presentation. Really appreciate. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, what did what new did you learn as regards the approaches are concerned? And when would you use Kaplan and when would you use Cockers? And when will you do extensile? or modified caucus and modified capillary. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, what I've mostly seen while managing radial head fractures is a cocker approach. But uh, the important uh, uh, point which I understood after reviewing the literature is that Kaplan uh, offers more visualization as compared to the caucus approach. Uh, I would prefer the caucus approach uh, when there is associated uh, injury to the lateral ulna collateral ligament because uh, it provides visualization of the complex and it will help in fixation of that complex. On the other hand, if the fracture is more anterior, uh, uh, the Kaplan approach, there is, there is associated risk of injury to the posterior androsis nerve. So that is one thing which needs to be kept in mind as the approach is more anterior as compared to the Cocker's approach. So anything that is given in this paper specifically to avoid injury to posterior androsis nerve? As the, uh, they mentioned standard, it time and again. The standard uh, principle of keeping the arm in pronation Forearm in pronation that is to be followed all the time while uh, avoiding to avoid injury to the nerves. Sir. And then, if you want to extend it, how would you do that? Uh, extension of uh, sir, the uh, approach. Suppose you want to put a plate yeah. and you wish to uh, it can extend, extend the approach. It, it can be extended distally, sir, but uh, usually it is not uh, extended uh, more than three to four centimeters below the radial neck because there is uh, that is the point where there is uh, the greatest risk of injury to the nerve. Okay. And another thing which is to be followed is uh, the supinator should be elevated subperiosteally so that the risk of injury is minimized. Great. Yeah. The others now can take over. Well done. Nice. Yeah. So, yeah, I would also agree with sir that your presentation is very crisp and absolutely to the point. Thank uh, you. Sir. As far as the approaches are concerned, you said the advantages of doing a Kaplan is that you can tackle uh, a tri terrible triad also, which, uh, yeah. yes, of course, uh, is an added advantage. So if there is a terrible triad, if there is a coronoid fracture, how would you approach that using the same a Kaplan's approach? Would you take a separate incision or would you just extend this one and go uh, on the coronoid? Uh, sir, uh, usually in case of a terrible triad, uh, the radial head, uh, to uh, approach the coronary, the radial head fragments usually need to be removed first. So uh, I would go with the same approach and uh, remove the radial head fragments. Uh, if there is a lot of combination, then approach the coronary, uh, fix the coronary, and then again go to the uh, fixation of the radial head or replacement as uh, uh, determined by the fracture pattern. And uh, finally, uh, fix the uh, tone or the avulsed lateral collateral ligament complex. Yeah, and one more question regarding replacement of. Uh... A plate fixation versus screw fixation of a, uh, of a radial head. What is the current mm -hmm. recommendation in literature? Whether you uh, use sir. a plate preferably or a screw and which results are better? Yes, sir. Uh, the plate is mainly used when there is an associated radial neck fracture. But uh, as per the review which I did, the uh, low profile screw fixation is now getting a, a more response. The, basically, it involves the use of screws to fix the head to the neck and uh, the study which I showed they had compared three constructs and uh, 
they found out that the greatest stiffness was when two cross screws were used for fixing the head to the neck. Uh, the plate had the least amount of stiffness, and obviously the plate is associated with a uh, more dissection, more risk of uh, damage to the nerve, as well as uh, uh, the increased risk of implant removal. So low profile screw fixation is uh, the uh, treatment which is nowadays being preferred for managing neck fractures as well. Can I just add, uh, ask something? Just extension of uh, Dr. Yes, Harshad's, yes. Harshad's question. Uh, you said that you would take out the head radius and then approach coronoid. Is there anything written in that paper which tells you that you can approach coronoid? I think that is that is one point they mentioned in that paper as to yes, approaching the, the coronoid extension. using this. Proximal extension of the Kaplan's approach uh, can also help in visualization of the coronoid, which right. is not provided by the Cocker's approach. That's right. How do you proximally go? Up to where do you go? Uh, sir, uh, uh, proximally around, uh, I would uh, extend it uh, proximal to the lateral epicondyle and uh, uh, have a dissection uh, to get to the coronoid. Good, good. Sorry to interrupt. Dr. Dhar and uh, Ashish. Ashish, you can go ahead. Right, right Rudra. So, good presentation. A lot of information to take in and uh, a very good topic. Uh, I wanted to ask two questions. Uh, yes, but in almost all the studies that you have reviewed, was there any study which now deals with anatomy? Anatomy of uh, the posterior interosseous nerve with regards to do the uh, like, you know, cadaveric dissection studies, which tell you, tells yes, you how best to keep it safe in the various injuries yes, that you have. Yes, and sir, the second part was uh, your title uh, discusses the that your title says the current techniques and outcomes, right? So you have told us what the recommendations are, but are there any differences in the outcomes of the different modalities of fixation in the long term, and which are associated with higher incidence of reoperations? Yes, sir. Uh, sir, uh, initially in the uh, cadaveric study, uh, which I had uh, shown in the presentation, they have mentioned uh, the technique to prevent damage to the posterior interosseous nerve. So the study says that although the Kap Kaplan approach is associated with more risk of injury to the PIN, uh, it passes through the supineta muscle and uh, keeping the arm in pronation is the main step. But the other important point is subperiodically elevating the supineta muscle. So this is one thing which they have mentioned which will avoid direct contact and handling of the nerve and will uh, decrease the risk of injury to the nerve. And uh, sir, uh, secondly, uh, regarding the uh, different studies which I have reviewed, uh, most of the studies, uh, the uh, uh, long-term follow-up with the radial head arthroplasty is currently not available, but uh, the mid-term and the short-term outcomes are, are available. So uh, uh, most of the studies recommend the basic principle that uh, type 1 fractures should be managed uh, non-operatively, major type 1. Mason type 2 fractures can be managed with open adduction, internal fixation, or conservatively. Uh, it is uh, more dependent upon the number of fragments. And type 3 fractures, uh, the most important uh, recommendation now is to manage them with radial head arthroplasty, uh, not go for open adduction, internal fixation, especially when there are more than three fragments and when there is combination. And uh, radial head resection is only to be preferred in patients who are old, basically more than 65 years of age. And it should not be done in the presence of uh, associated injuries at, as it can lead to increased incidence of elbow instability. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Thank you, judges. And thank you, Rudra. Now, I invite uh, Dr. Shah Rukh Khan for sharing his presentation. Yeah, we can see it. Good evening, everyone. Uh, shall I start? Uh, just make it uh, full screen. Yeah. Yeah, you can start now. Is my uh, is am I audible, sir? Yeah, you're audible. Your screen is visible. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. Good evening, everybody. We are uh, going to uh, I'm going to discuss about the plate fixation versus intermedullary nailing in humerus shaft fractures today. My name is Dr. Sharuk. I am a senior resident from um, Loknaik Hospital and Mulan Azad Medical College. The incidence of shaft humerus fracture is 1-5% to of all fractures, which amounts to around 13-20 to per lakh population. It has a bimodal presentation. The complications are malunion, non-union and radial nerve injury. 
I'm just up, touching upon the conservative management to uh, tell about the importance of this uh, talk. The <clears throat> conservative management is done by bracing for 10 to 12 weeks. It uh, the humerus uh, in humerus malunion is acceptable to a high degree. There is high rate of non-union, high rate of shoulder and elbow stiffness uh, related to conservative management. The overall union rate is around 83%, which is uh, further just 76% in the proximal one third of the uh, humerus fractures. The risk factors for non-union are smoking, female sex, initial displacement of the fracture, old age more than 55, and the transfers and uh, oblique fractures are have a lower union rate compared to comminuted fractures. Coming to method methodology uh, for this study, <clears throat> The objective of this study was to review literature on surgical management of shaft humerus fractures using plating and nailing. This uh, sharp terms shaft humerus fractures, uh, plate, intramedullary nail, and randomized controlled uh, trials were searched on PubMed and for uh, last ten years studies. And the studies which had which were related to plating and nailing of shaft humerus fractures and minimal invasive plating of the shaft humerus fractures and which were RCTs were included. Uh, retrospective studies and case reports uh, were excluded from this study and we have include i have included uh, three studies with, uh, which were comparing open plating versus nailing two studies uh, which compared minimal invasive plating versus open plating and two studies with uh, which compared minimal invasive plating with intramedullary nailing these are the surgical indications of the humerus fracture the surgical treatment options are open uh, reduction and internal fixation, which is also known as open reduction and plate osteosynthesis. I will be calling this open plating, <clears throat> intermedial nailing and minimal invasive plating. The open plating is done by uh, anterolateral approach in the upper and middle one third of the humerus fracture. The lower one third humerus fractures are approached by a posterior approach. A 4.5 mm plate should be applied and at least eight cortices or four screws should be applied on each either side of the fracture. The locking screws are uh, preferable in only the weaker bones. The uh, open plating is associated with 87 to 96% of union rates, but the complication rates are very high. They are 5 to 25%. The main complications are infection, non-union, which is due to stripping of soft tissues and malreduction, malunion, hardware failure, and there is a high risk of itrogenic radial nerve palsy which is uh, highest in the posterior approach. Coming to nailing, uh, intermediary nailing is done by a deltoid split approach in which the rotator cuff muscle supraspinatus is also split. The entry is made between greater trochanter and articular surface of the humerus. Uh, reduction of the fracture is done and the guide wire is passed. <clears throat> reaming is done only in the proximal part. However, in the young patients, reaming of the canal can also be done, but it is associated with higher risk of radial nerve injury. The nail is passed. Uh, a short size of uh, nail should be passed because the longer nails are associated with distraction of the fracture side and impingement at the shoulder joint. The proximal locking is done and followed by distal locking. And distal locking is done in the AP uh, anteroposterior direction which is safer. Intramedullary nailing is associated with 86 to 100% union and the non-union is associated due to fracture distraction due to a long nail. There are very high shoulder complications due to, which is due to a prominent nail which causes acromial trauma and rotator cuff damage. This can cause impingement, loss of motion at the shoulder joint and loss of strength. Coming to minimal invasive plating, Two incisions are given. Uh, the proximal incision is in the distal deltopectoral interval, and the, another incision is given distally, which is five centimeter proximal to the elbow crease. A 12 hole plate is used, which is slided from proximal to distal end under C arm guidance, and three screws are applied on each side. <clears throat> the plate is slid between the biceps and the brachialis muscle, which uh, prevents injury to the radial nerve, which lies between the brachialis and the brachioradialis muscle. In the distal incision, the cutaneous nerve of, fo of forearm, forearm and muscular cutaneous nerve should be, uh, the injury should be prevented. The post-operative care 
is same for all these three, uh, uh, which is shoulder range of motion exercises, active and active assisted exercises, post-op weight uh, re restriction till three months. And if the patient is using crutches, it should be used as tolerated. These are three RCTs, which were which are comparing open plating with intramedullary nailing. In all these three studies, the infection rates were higher in the open plating, but the shoulder function was worse in the intramedullary nailing uh, technique. These two studies compare minimal invasive plating with intramedullary nailing. The rate of non-union and hydrogenic nerve palsy was higher in the intramedullary nailing compared to minimal invasive plating, while the infection rates and functional outcome were same. These two studies are comparing minimal invasive plating with open plating and there is a high risk of uh, hydrogenic radial nerve palsy in the open plating as compared to minimal invasive plating and the infection and non-union rates were also higher in the open plating while the functional outcome was same in both. This is a meta-analysis which shows different uh, aspects of the related to minimal invasive plating, open plating, intermittent nailing, and non-operative treatment. The non-union rates are higher in the open, uh, in the intermittent nailing and uh, non-operative treatment, while they are lowest in the minimal invasive plating. Uh, hydrogenic nerve palsy is higher in the intermittent nailing and the open plating, while they are low in uh, minimal invasive plating. The infection rates were also high in the open plating, and the functional outcome was best seen in the minimal invasive plating, while it was worse, uh, worse in the non-operative treatment and uh, intermittent nailing. The conclusion of this review is that the plating has a high risk of infection, intermittent intramedial nail has a high risk of shoulder problems, and minimal invasive plating has better results than both in terms of functional outcome and lower incidence of radial nerve injury. These are the references which I have used for this study. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sharuk. You to finish with uh, four seconds left. So that's my timer. So nice study. And let's go ahead with judges to ask questions. Over to you, Agashi. Sir, uh, Sanjay Dhar is there, I think. Yes, sir. Dr. Dhar? Yes, sir. Would you like to? Ask. No, no, it is your privilege. Okay. Okay. Uh, very well done, Sharuk. I Thank think you. all three were, all two were, sorry, two of them. Third, we have to, he is still to present, but both of you have done a good job. Thank now, uh, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, you said short nail. How do you define short nail? Sir, uh, the nail should not be protruding uh, into the subacromial space and it should be around five centim uh, at least five centimeter uh, above the uh, sir, uh, uh, tip of the uh, lateral epicondyle, sir. Tip of the lateral epicondyle. Lateral okay. epicondyle yes. I believe uh, from your diagram, you said you pass the plate between brachialis and biceps. Yes, sir. For minimally invasive. That is yes. where you put your plate between brachialis and biceps. Sir, it is put at the on the anterior surface, a slid on the anterior surface and between these two muscles. Between these two muscles. Yes, sir. So, uh, which nerve passes between these two muscles? Uh, sir, uh, musculocutaneous and... Uh, so, if you put the plate between brachialis and biceps, a, it would be reasonably away from the both and you are very likely to injure this nerve, isn't it? Sir, uh, it is said in these studies that if you supinate the forearm completely, then there is very low risk of uh, injury to both radial nerve and musculocutaneous nerve. Okay. Uh, now, which nail have you been talking about? Is it the new multi-lock nail or the old one? Sir, uh, one study was uh, uh, on the old nail and two studies were from for the uh, interlock nail, which is newer one. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Over to... <coughs> uh, 
Over to uh, Ashish. You can go ahead with your questions. Yeah. So Sharuk, if you were to have a nail or a plate, if you were to have a fracture, you must. What would you do? <laughs> Sir, it will depend on the fracture. Uh, the intramedullary nails are preferred in the segmental fractures and the pathological fractures. So I would keep the nail for those fractures only. And I would like to go for a minimal invasive plating if there is a mid shaft fracture. And depending upon the fracture morphology, I will uh, use open plating if there is a combination of, uh, or if there is a extension into the joint that is. But when they have compared the papers, they have compared a particular fracture type, isn't it? Yes, sir. Most of the yeah. fractures were, sir, middle one third transverse fractures uh, were compared most of the, in most of the studies, sir. Did any one of them have a preoperative palsy? Sir, some, uh, most of the studies they have excluded, all the studies which I have included, they have excluded the preoperative nerve palsies in all these patients because they were uh, checking for the itrogenic radial nerve palsy. So I've excluded right. those studies, sir. And in which of the which of the treatment modalities is your risk of reoperation higher? Sir, risk of reoperation is uh, highest in the intramedullary nails because uh, the non-union rates due to distraction are higher. And uh, sir, there is a need to remove the nail because of subacromial impingement. These were the two indications due to which uh, repeat surgery was done, sir. And the and second was the open plating. Yes, sir. As regards to the post-operative radial nerve palsies or post-operative palsies, which of the three modalities was a re-exploration required? Sir, re studies? Sir, uh, in the cases where uh, of intermedial nails, uh, the <laughs> second treatment was to apply a plate and remove the nail. So they have explored radial nerve. Otherwise, it was not required. And most of them were treated conservatively only. Okay. Excellent. I think uh, that's sir, a sir, any question? Yeah, Shahrukh, I think uh, I am not sure whether you presented any uh, literature on, I mean, the types of fractures like plating, we generally tend to use for very transverse fractures. Nailing, we try to use for community. So could you find anything in the literature and... You have not said anything about mal rotation in such fractures. So could you find anything in the literature regarding that? Because generally my indication would for a nailing would be a comminuted uh, shaft fracture where you can't do a good plating. So could you find results of such fractures or could you segregate them in the literature? Sir, I just found that the segmental fractures have a better uh, result with a nail. And if the fracture is severely comminuted, then it is better to go for a non-operative treatment in these patients. So are there any guidelines which you could find in the literature regarding these indications? No, sir. And anything about any pre-contoured plates you could check? There are there were earlier times when we could even synthesize it, come out with a pre-contoured plate, which is a curved plate. For so, there was no mention of pre-contoured plates in the middle one third. They just have talked about uh, it in the distal humerus fractures, which had articular combination. No. Okay. To continue to that, to continue that question, what about mal rotation? In which modality the mal rotation has been more? Sir, there was no mention of any uh, this particular complication. And okay. because the intermedial nails, they are locked. So uh, they do not uh, tend to malrotate post-operatively. No, that is not a... I, that is not a... Uh, right. uh, sir, it sir, doesn't... Uh, malrotation occurs at the time of reduction. It's not oh, so after the locking. Pre -op okay, sir. Malrotation is hidden by the fact that the shoulder is allowing more movement. So it may not be evident that malrotation has occurred with a, with a nail. It's quite common with a nail. You might get extreme rotations, one side more and the other side less, which will detect this kind of malrotated. Uh, with a plating, the malrotation is less likely. Sir, there was no mention of uh, malrotation in these studies. And uh, they've just uh, uh, talked about the functional outcomes using the UCL and ACS, ASCS scores. I believe uh, my, I just suggest to read more about the MIPO technique. 
Okay, sir. This paper which you have quoted does tell you a bit more. Hmm? Yeah, sure, sir. Yeah. But well done. Well done. Thank you, sir. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sharuk, and thank you, the judges. Let's thank move you. on to our next uh, contestant, Dr. Vasa Somani. You can share your presentation. Yeah. Okay, we can see. You're muted, Vaso. Just uh, unmute yourself. I'll just unmute myself. Yes, sir. Okay, we can hear you. Uh, is my my... Presentation. Yeah. You go ahead. Uh, good evening, everyone. Yeah, I'm Dr. Vaso Soman, senior resident at KM Hospital. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank Bombay Orthopedic Society for providing me this opportunity to present on this platform. My uh, topic of presentation is surgical techniques and outcome. So, Fracture was first described by Giovanni Battista Montigia in 1814, where he described the lesion as a traumatic fracture of a proximal cord of Pella and an anterior dislocation of proximal epiphysophridian. This was later on described by uh, uh, Jose Luis Bardo, where he gave the Bardo classification and further described the Montigia lesions and Montigia class Montigia equivalence. He classified the Montigia lesions as type 1, 2, 3, 4, where type 1 is anterior uh, dislocation of proximal uh, radius with a shaft of Pella fracture. Uh, then there is type 2 is posterior dislocation of radius. Then there is third, type 3 is lateral dislocation of radius, radial head, and type 4 is anterior dislocation of radius with the fracture of both uh, radius and alla. So my methodology for today's presentation has been an electronic database search, uh, which includes PubMed and Google Scholar articles with the studies which are relevant in the last 10 years. References list of selected articles were assessed to include any other relevant studies. Studies uh, with the high citation index were chosen for the narrative review. So why are Montage lesions important? Although the incidence of Montage lesions among the pediatric elbow fractures is 2%, the incidence of missed Montage and incidence of uh, the rate of Montage revisions is almost 10 times higher than the uh, incidence. So that is why we need to focus on the Montage lesions. So the key find, radiologic finding is the loss of radiocapitular relationship. The Smith in this you know, first study mentioned that the radiocapitular lesion, uh, line should pass through the capitulum. He does not mention anywhere that it should bisect the capitulum. And the recent literature, also questions the validity of uh, this finding that uh, when a line is drawn along the radial shaft, it misses the capitulum in a 16% radiograph of normal limbs. So in, uh, also the most consistent radiocapital line is drawn along the radial neck on lateral view. This has been mentioned because in literature there has been confusion whether the line is to be drawn from the radial neck or the radial shaft. So what are the two principles of fixation? The two principles of fixation for multiple lesions are stable elbow joint and a stable fixation of ulna restoring the ulna length by stable fixation. So we have this uh, uh, three-step approach to approach the Montage fracture, which has been mentioned in the injury journal in the article in 2021, where they have identified the Montage lesion based on radiograph. And further, they have assessed the ulnar fracture pattern. This ulnar fracture pattern may be incomplete or a complete fracture pattern. The incomplete fracture pattern may be a plastic deformation of a ulna or a green stick fracture, which can be man managed by close reduction and above elbow cast. Then we move on to the complete fractures of ulna, which may be a length stable or a length unstable fracture. The length unstable may be a transverse or a short oblique fracture, which can be managed by intramedial annealing. Whereas the length unstable fracture may be long, long oblique or a comminuted fracture, which are managed by open reduction, internal fixation with plating. Okay, so this algorithm, if we keep in mind, this, there has been a study by Ramsky et al. in a journal of pediatric orthopedics in 2015, where they carried out a multicentric examination of treatment strategy. They have taken a sample of 112 pediatric Montage fracture patients and they have followed the previously mentioned algorithm where if we follow the treatment strategies mentioned in the algorithm and if we become aggressive as compared to the strategy, there are no failures. However, if we become less aggressive and does not follow the strategy that has been mentioned, so there are high chances of failure in the study. So this study points out that there is uh, importance of surgical management of Montage fractures and one can become aggressive when in down. Six tips to not mess up the pediatric Montage fractures are we need to obtain optimal radiograph, a full length radiograph of a forearm with the elbow because uh, there are high chances of missing the radial head dislocation. One should be aware of a differential diagnosis of congenital radial head dislocation. One should identify the unusual Montage fractures. And once we are in doubt, we it should go ahead with the fixation rather than a conservative management because there are high chances of late dislocation. Hence, one should obtain a weekly radiograph and one should be aware of nerve injuries. Here we complete these uh, pediatric Montage fractures. There is a difference between the pediatric and adult Montage fractures. Hence, Jupiter has further elaborated on the Bardos type 2 Montage fracture classification. So, this Jupiter classification helps us divide the surgical management of Montage fractures and also helps us prognosticate the outcome. He has divided the type 2 Bardos uh, fractures into type 2A, 2B, 2C, and 2D. 
type 2a is a fracture of the proximal ulna including the coronal type 2b is a fracture distal to ulna which include which does not include coronal type 2c is a diaphyseal fracture of ulna type 2d is a diaphyseal diaphyseal metaphyseal combination of ulna with a fracture of coronal so two important considerations that are to be kept in mind while fixing the proximal ulna is the two anatomical parameters which are proximal ulna deviation angle which has been due to anterior tilt of the proximal ulna and a varus angulation of ulna the current devices that have been come into existence are the uh, locking compression plate which are the anatomical plate they are de designed in such a way that uh, these two parameters are kept in mind and once these are followed adequate fixation of proximal ulna is possible and the recent study also uh, emphasizes on the fixation of proximal ulna using a locking compression plate which has a less revision and a less rate of ulna non unit as compared to the non locking compression plate now the common algorithm that i found while managing the com complex adult montage of fracture is this one is the we follow a posterior midline approach we begin by reconstruction or replacement of radial head which is then followed by stabilization of ulnar shaft including the coronoid process this following the stabilization of ulnar shaft this ulnar shaft is then fixed to the olecranon once adequate restoration of ulna length is achieved we can reduce the radio reconstructed or replace radial head to the radio capital joint and a coronal plane instability may be assessed any instability may then later on be addressed lastly so the outcomes the outcomes for the complex adult montage of fractures have been assessed based on the classification scores radial head ulna man union and associated injuries in a study from journal of bone and joint surgery conrad et al in 2017 have assessed the long term results and prognostic factors following a patient sample of 47 over a period of 8.4 years and here's found out that there is poor prognostic value of pardo type 2 and in them the pupeter type 2a and 2d has a poor prognostic value the only drawback while assessing this long term results are there was no prosthetic replacement that was carried out in this study the another study from journal of bone and joint surgery they uh, younglo et al in 2018 have provided mid term results of 46 cases uh, he had produced good to excellent mid term results in separate clinical entities the advantage of this study he has clearly defined the montage lesion and this is the largest sample which has which have been defined clearly and all the outcomes have been assessed separately uh the although there is a controversy in management of radial head fractures and its outcomes because there are multiple uh, the studies in the literature have proposed a controversial management two studies that are found up for have a comparable period of follow up one by matar et al in 2017 He has mentioned that the functional outcome is not affected by the severity of radial head fracture. By Klug et al. in 2019, has presented an article in Bone and Joint Journal where he has mentioned that the mesen type three fracture and the associated coronal fracture that have been um, managed by radial head arthroplasty have poorer outcome. This study emphasizes that the replacement is more com more favored than excision. And the study by Klug et al. in 2019 mentioned that the excision more than replacement. Hence, there is a controversy in the literature regarding the management of montage uh, radial head. in a patient with complex montagia injuries also we have a study where they have patient uh, where jong et al in 2020 have assessed the mid term outcomes of a montagia like lesions with the radial head arthroplasty and he has achieved satisfactory result however the complication rates and revisions rates are very high although now we would like to consider the poor prognostic factor that helps us in determining the outcomes so the bardo type 2 jupiter type a sx loperesty injuries associated coronary and radial head fracture and ulna non union are the poor prognostic factors so i would like to end my presentation with the thought that observation is not enough one must think and observation without thought is as dangerous as thought without observation this is by ose louis pardo and this are my list of references thank you dr vaso you to finished in time with few seconds left uh over to judges for questions agashi sir you can start great presentation vasu a couple of questions uh, how common are these montagia variants you said that you need to be careful about montagia variants how common are they uh sir so the anything? thing with the montagia uh okay yes sir uh, is there anything in the literature which tells you uh, how common are these montagia variants So the problem with the montage variants are there are no clearly defined montage lesions, and also there are possibility of high chance of misdiagnosis concerning the complex adult montage injuries. And there is no proper incidence that has been reported concerning the this complex variant of adult montage injuries. Okay, let me specify also, is... pediatric variants. Okay, uh, I mean there have been 
uh, there has been a paper where they have said that Montesia variants uh, occur far more frequently, far more frequently than classic Montesia. Okay. okay. Uh, now, secondly, in the theater, after we have fixed your alna, what would you do? What would be your first step? You have fixed the alna. Now, what would you do? Okay. I would check for the adequate stability of alna. And uh, once I would check the stability of alna, I would see whether the radial head has automatically come into place following the reconstruction and whether there is adequate contact of the radial head with the sigma notch or the sigma notch of the alna. So that helps us in determining that we have adequately fixed the coronoid and the radiocapitular joint stability has also been restored. <laughs> following that, how, how will you see that? If you have you are fixing only the alna, you are not exposing the radius, isn't it? Generally. So how will you do that? Okay. Uh, I, I, I would take a, a, a prefer a Boyd's approach to in order to see both the electronon and the radial head simultaneously. Okay. Is there anything? Suppose you have fixed only the alna. Expose and fix the alna. Okay. What all, what all views will you take because that is something that is mentioned in the literature as to what views do you take to confirm that the radial head is there in place. Not an issue. I think uh, Harshad would like to ask something. Yeah, I see. I just one observation, uh, 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 so many. That you have a lot of material which you're trying to present in a eight minutes. I do understand that it's a very broad topic, but you're talking too rapidly. Sometimes it's difficult to understand what you're trying to convey. So try and at least curtail your uh, content so that it becomes a little more audible and a little more understandable. This is just general. Otherwise, the matter inside your uh, presentation was pretty good. And uh, the questions asked by uh, Agashi sir are quite relevant. How do you determine intraoperatively whether you need to do something for the radial head and or whether you need to leave it alone is a very important question you should have to answer. And for that to get intraoperative uh, uh, views to understand that the radial head is actually back in place because you didn't mention the two lines, and, but it was an inconclusive uh, argument. You know, but which is the final line which you would consider to understand that your radial head is now back in relation to the capitulum as what it should be. That has been left open. The... Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead and answer. So it is the, I think it is the radio radio capital line that we need to assess on a lateral view that helps us to determine if the radial head, the radial head, the line drawn from the radial neck to the capitulum, if it just intersects the capitulum, uh, we can confirm that our radial head is back in place and the ulna anatomical uh, configuration of ulna has also been restored. Suppose it is not there, then what would you do? To fix the alna, uh, the radial head is okay. not falling into the parameter which you want it. Then what is your next step? Uh, okay, so maybe sir, I'll look uh, at the CM show, interoperative fluoroscopy shoots of the alna. And maybe if I say I have not restored the proximal anatomical configuration of alna, that is the only reason that it might not come into place because if you have adequately restored the anatomical configuration of ulna, the radial head automatically falls in place. Generally, once you restore the length and angulation of the ulna, your radial head should fall back in place. So you have to check if there is a rotational malalignment or whether you have made the ulna a little shorter than what it should be, yes. especially if there is a comminuted uh, segment. Ashish can answer, ask the question. Right, so uh, a lot of material to take in, as uh, Dr. Harshad said, yeah, it's a vast topic, but yes, uh, try to space it out uh, in, for the lack of time. Uh, I wanted to ask something regarding adult uh, Montagia variants. I mean, sir said that it, uh, they are very common. Uh, there was a slide where you mentioned in adult Montagia, then uh, they have fixed the radial head first, and then they have gone on to fix the olecran. Is that uh, yeah. correct what you said? Uh, sir, th that is the, actually I looked up the literature and that is the most common algorithm that I had come across. That you begin your fixation by posterior approach and start fixing the reconstruction, start reconstructing the radial head. 
and if it is not possible you go ahead with the replacement and that, then start fixing the ulna and the corona that is what i had come across in the literature was it was a bit controversial so i could not gather a, there was no review article or anything that could lead me to a proper approach as in how to approach the complex variants okay. uh dar sir any questions not really um uh, so uh, regarding this uh, isex loplasty type where there is disruption of the interosseous membrane could you find any literature how do you assess, assess them how how do you isolate such injuries and their long term results because we always talk about that but i am at least not able to preoperatively see them clinically could you find any literature uh, so uh no sir because uh, those injuries are uh, that the literature that i had come across may uh, where a case where such case reports only there were no review articles that were available because most of these lesions are not reported only so i could not gather a proper article which is adequate strength in order to represent it here so okay. any role of mri or any in such injuries you could find any literature no 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 sir i had not regarding know. delayed presentation did you study anything about delayed presentation of these fractures where the radial head has been out uh, for some time and yet if you fix ulna whether fixation is the same algorithm works for them also uh possible but the literature that i had come across is after two weeks it is very difficult to uh, have the radial head in place following a conservative management we need to have a aggressive approach where we need to fix the ulna and in order to restore the radial head back in place if it is anteriorly translated we need to do a angulation osteotomy of the ulna posteriorly so that the radial head following that angulation comes in place okay okay thank you great okay thank so you. just to answer yes. let, just to answer my question what is important very often after plating the ulna you take a cm shoot like this and what is important is you must rotate the forearm in full pronation and supination and very often it dislocates in pronation so that is something you have to remember okay okay i have just one comment about the presentation so you said you selected the article by high citation index the articles don't have citation indexes so authors that have citation index. keep in mind that okay thank you dr vasav and thank you thank you all judges over to dar sir for closing remarks uh, and also invite the judges for their comments on the program yeah they can uh, thank you very much agash sir ashish and harshad thank you we always look forward to your presence in this uh, session we have love more for the second round also so thank you very much and thank you all the participants for you know presenting nice presentations so over back to judges agash sir for his uh, concluding remarks at, at the outset i must congratulate dr dhar dr ashok and dr neeraj for this great idea uh, the conceptualization was really good secondly i really congratulate all the three presenters for excellent presentation their the way they presented the way they answered was fantastic you are much much better than what i was when i was your age much better well done are probably you are better than me even today well <laughs> so i do agree with sir the presentations were really really excellent Uh, you do require a little bit of polishing to you know reach levels where the senior people have taken years and years and years to reach so i think this is a good stepping stone and a good idea by the present bus uh, ec team uh, led by sanjay dhar to pick out such people from our community and give them a platform on which they can present uh, their skills rather than you know having them to struggle the whole way which most of us uh, have had uh, to do so this is a good opportunity and, and and i can see that people are making good use of it ashish excellent 
thank you very much sir for making me a part of it but it's quite uh, you know very encouraging and pleasing to see the energy that uh, these people bring in so rudra vasav and sharuk you know uh, hats off for the effort that you have put in very good and uh, as you go along and you'll realize that you know you don't need to you know fill in the 28 slides or so you know 8 minute presentation could have been in only 14 slides or 16 slides at the most uh, and uh, i would have preferred to see uh, sort of a maybe a larger font uh, a different sh shade you know a, a black lettering on a white background and things like that but those are not very very important uh, what was also important is that um, you, you know you're competing for the rising star and all of you are stars you will rise very high but i also wanted to see your opinion on that you know you're presenting a literature uh, review as a rising star and in the end you say okay this is what i read and this is what i think i would take it from that like i asked you a question if you have to have a fractured humerus what would you choose and you said if i have to have a fractured humerus uh, which is a simple transverse i would get it pleated or something like that you know a very clear message at the end of it because ultimately this will go on youtube people will watch that and you will be stars we hope to see you in vairog uh, thanks atashis i hope you are coming for vairog all of you <laughs> yeah they are not me sir sun nahi rahe dr neeraj are you around yes yeah over to you yeah so it was fantastic uh, these are the three common fractures which we will see on a day to day basis and i i fully agree with ashish that basically uh, all of you who are going to be the future presenters maybe can include that and do uh, see the video which was posted in the group of dr dinin ganjwala which was taken on vairog global uh, to see how to make a better presentation in the future so with this we close today's session thank you and hope to see all of you, you in the much. next session thank you very much Thank, thank, you. thank you thank you good luck thank you bye bye thank, thank you sir. bye bye well done okay sir. bye bye sir.